Welcome back to Psychopharmacology. This week, we're going to cover the material on alcohol. And um, since I'm an alcohol researcher, I um, like to spend lots of time talking about this topic. So I did try and keep this lecture fairly short and it's, there's a lot more material in the chapter, but um, you know, I did try and, and hit a few highlights on this topic area. So we are now switching gears and talking about sedative drugs. So we had spent a lot of time talking about stimulant drugs. Now we have moved to sedative drugs and alcohol is a sedative drug. Um, so as a sedative drug, it's um, going to calm the brain down, um, decrease neural activity. And so you'll see sort of things that um, sedation type effects like decreased alertness in people who are drinking increased fatigue, it slows down cognitive processing. So um, all of those things indicate the brain is working more slowly. Um, at low doses, you will see um, stimulation and decreased um, inhibition of actions. And again, we talked about the paradoxical effects that you see sometimes with drugs. Um, and I'll remind you about the attention deficit disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder medications, which are stimulants, and they calm children down. Well, the same thing is true here, where alcohol is calming down the prefrontal cortex and the frontal cortex of the brain, the, the front part of your brain here, um, those are the areas of the brain that are the location of self-control. And so at small amounts of alcohol, the alcohol is affecting that area of the brain first. And so that's why you see decreased inhibition. So people will blurt out things that they probably normally would know to keep to themselves. Um, at higher doses, then you would really see those sedative effects. And in this image here on the right, you'll see one of my former students in the lab giving a breathalyzer reading. So a lot of the research that I did involved alcohol administration in the lab. And that's how we start to learn a lot of these various things is we give alcohol subjects to social drinkers and then look at what happens to those individuals when the dose is active in their system. So this is your brain from the side. Um, so, uh, Looking at the brain, I've talked about this before, but the idea um, of your brain is that some parts of your brain tell you to go. The limbic system, um, the center part of your brain, um, those are the parts of your brain that tell you to go after a goal. Um, then there's the other part of your brain that are um, the, the frontal cortex, that's the stop part of your brain that sort of tells you to wait, let's just see. So you've probably seen now a couple of times, both from my lectures and other um, researchers that I've um, given you um, lectures to watch, is that there's part of your brain that's kind of like the gas pedal that gets you to go. And, the, and then there's the part of your brain that is the, um, the brakes that um, tells you to slow down. And the thing with alcohol is that the frontal cortex, that's the first part of the brain that alcohol starts acting on, but that's also the part of the brain that is not fully developed until people are well into their 20s. And so that's where the mix of alcohol and underage drinking can be really pretty devastating because those are the parts of the brain that aren't fully developed anyways. And then the drug impacts that area most significantly and other drugs of abuse also sometimes have that action. So a lot of times I get questions in class, what is a safe amount of alcohol? And in fact, there are very clear guidelines. So the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism um, under the National Institutes of Health <clears throat> has determined from research, what are, um, what are the amounts of alcohol that people can drink that is um, low risk? Meaning you're not gonna get sick, from cancer or um, liver disease, or um, you know, I put yourself at risk for very serious accidents. So when you look at the number of drinks, first of all, look at the bottom of the slide. Um, we're talking about 12 ounce beer is one standard drink or a five ounce glass of wine um, or one and a half ounces of um, spirits mixed into a drink or by itself. Um, 
when you look at on a single day, men should never um, exceed more than four of these standard drinks. And women should never exceed three based on differences in body weight and metabolism. And then there's a weekly guideline of no more than 14 drinks per week for men and no more than seven drinks per week for women. So if you stick within those single day and weekly limit guidelines, then generally your health should be protected. You should be drinking in a range that is considered low risk. If you go above those guidelines, then you start to see health concerns and safety concerns significantly. Um, and so, um, you know, a lot of times people aren't sure what those guidelines are, but they're, they're actually well-established research-based guidelines. And so once you look at those guidelines, if you look at the U.S. population, you'll see that about 38 million adults in the U.S. drink too much. And we're in the middle of this COVID global pandemic, and data seems to indicate that this rate is increasing as everyone is spending so much time at home and struggling with a lot of stress. Um, so we're talking about a very large segment of the population that has concerns about the alcohol consumption. Only one in six have talked about it ever with a physician. And in if you think about your own personal last visit with a physician, whether that was a in-person visit or a virtual visit, ask yourself if you were asked about, asked about your alcohol consumption. In many cases, it's never even broached as a topic, even though physicians should be always asking about that. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that is important is that alcohol use is very devastating to a developing fetus. So any pregnant woman should not be drinking anything. So those guidelines assume that a pregnant woman would not be consuming any alcohol. And then because of the development of the brain, any alcohol use by those under the age of 21 is also considered to be problematic because of the fact that that part of the brain that is affected by alcohol first is not even fully developed until someone's in their 20s. And so um, for this very reason, I think that's why I was interested in alcohol research. I think that it just affects so many people. So, so many people um, don't live, live their optimal lives because of, of drinking too much. And it causes lots of health problems that are preventable. And um, so information that you can disseminate to other people about what's safe. You may be the only person who in your network of people really know this information. So, you know, it, it comes with a certain amount of privilege to, to, you know, you don't want to tell somebody you're drinking too much, you know, but, you know, you can state it like, you know, you know, like there are guidelines I learned in my class about what safe drinking is. And, you know, it's at this level and just wanted you to know. And, and sometimes a lot of people realize that if they get back into the safe, low risk drinking guidelines, their health improves in a variety of different ways. Um, another thing to consider as well is that and I'm sure you probably already sort of know this, but binge drinking or drinking to the level of intoxication um, is a problem of young people, just like all psychoactive drug use is a problem of young people. So if you look at the rates of binge drinking among 18 to 20 year olds and 21 to 25 year olds, you see the highest rates of binge drinking and then it drops off with time. <clears throat> and um, the, the rates of binge drinking, it can be anywhere from a little over 20% to almost 30% in those high risk groups, those age groups. But what this also means is that there are certain individuals in these age groups who don't drink at all. So we have, you know, some people who don't drink at all, some people who drink excessively so that they're getting intoxicated, which comes with a lot of risks. And then there are moderate drinkers in, in between. And, um, you know, we, we know, for example, that um, individuals who don't drink at all think they're the only ones. And in fact, there's a large segment of the population that doesn't drink alcohol at all. Um, and then, um, you know, the people who are drinking excessively may age out. So as they get past, you know, maybe college years and they get into the world of, you know, a regular job, it's harder to drink to the level of intoxication when you have to be at work at 8 a.m., and so um, there's a developmental change that happens that is beneficial to health as drinking the same level maybe tapers off. So 
um, there's that as well. So why is binge drinking or drinking to intoxication um, a problem for health and well-being? Well, first of all, for college students, it's a very well documented effect that students who drink more have poorer academic performance. Not surprising, I guess. You know, if you're drinking so much that you get intoxicated, you don't do your assignments, you might miss class, you um, get behind in classes. Um, so students who are stronger students tend to drink less. Um, and if your academic performance is suffering and you drink, drink drinking less might help your academic performance. Um, it also causes social and personal problems. Sometimes when people are intoxicated, they act in ways that alienate their friends, their family members, their significant others. Um, and so they oftentimes um, have lots of consequences to that drinking. Also, the um, binge drinking can lead to intoxicated driving. Um, the property damage is just, you know, people being silly and, and doing things, suffering injuries. Um, when I was a postdoctoral fellow, a student um, was drinking and they fell out of a residence hall window and died. You know, those kinds of injuries completely preventable if the person hadn't been drinking so much. And a really sort of sad and devastating when someone is at the prime of their life and then it's an accident like that that causes their death so, so early. Uh, violence and risky sexual behavior are very much tied to drinking um, on the part of, part of the perpetrator or the victim. Also, someone can be poisoned from alcohol and um, accidents sometimes just happen from um, being intoxicated. So sometimes it could be just like a minor thing, like, you know, you're not walking as well as you might normally. And so you trip over the curb, you break your ankle, and then you end up finding yourself in the emergency room. Had you not been drinking, you might have been more steady on your feet and none of that would have happened. And over the long term, the, the risk of alcohol depend, dependence gets serious as someone develops a significant daily drinking problem or often drinking problem. And um, it can also lead to very serious problems with uh, liver cirrhosis. So what do you see, whether it's in the lab or in um, everyday um, life, is that at lower doses of alcohol, people tend to be disinhibited where they those inhibitions that normally make you be quiet and not say something um, or think through your, your next step. You, you tend not to think through carefully those next steps. You tend not to weigh in on your actions. You just blurt out or do something impulsively. Um, people feel stimulated and talkative, maybe more aggressive, maybe more reaching out to others, a greater libido for sexual activity. At higher doses, then you see the sedative effects as the alcohol takes over the brain. Um, psychomotor performance gets impaired. <clears throat> Working memory, attention, all those things start to get impaired. These are all the things that contribute to your skills at driving um, and other kinds of things. And um, so uh, it can make you a poor driver. It can make you a poor at doing all kinds of things. And at very high doses, alcohol is very dangerous as a sedative drug. It can ultimately lead to death. The person first may become unconscious and then may slip into a coma and then death can occur. And every year in the United States, we have completely preventable deaths, especially in young people um, where they binge drink excessively and then they slip into unconsciousness. And instead of someone taking them to the hospital where they need to be if they're unconscious, they, they ultimately slip into a coma and, and die. Again, it's just devastating. Sometimes it's from asphyxiation, so they choke on their vomit, so they vomit, and then they choke, choke on it as well. That's another cause of death. When you look at driving specifically as a, a, an issue with alcohol, alcohol impaired driving um, accounts for one third of US fatal crashes. Um, early onset drinking predicts early onset alcohol impaired driving. So preventing younger um, adolescents from drinking will prevent impaired driving. And um, one third of alcohol impaired drivers are between the ages of 21 and 34, and often um, a little bit more likely to be young men than young women. Um, so we do know that it is the individuals, young adulthood individuals who tend to be the impaired drivers. So, um, 
a lot of times people think, oh, it's like the older chronic alcoholic that is called causing all the impaired driving accidents. And that doesn't support itself in the data. The data is that impaired driving is largely from younger people. Why does driving matter? So this is the blood alcohol concentration in the individual and at, at low levels when individuals um, have consumed maybe one or two drinks, that's when their ability to pay attention and, and track and steer the car um, starts to get impaired. And as the amount of alcohol consumed continues to increase, um, all kinds of other problems come into play. So um, emergency responses is something that you will see even with, you know, a drink or two in the system, the, the child running in front of the road and you having to slam on the brakes to not hit a child, that's an emergency response. And any alcohol in your system um, doesn't even have to be at the legal limit. You're gonna have trouble doing that task. Coordination gets worse as, as the person spends um, more time drinking and then drives. Um, information processing, speed control, so um, the ability to maintain the speed limit, um, sometimes impaired drivers are pulled over by police because they're driving so slowly, they don't realize they're not driving the speed limit or they're driving too fast, they just can't calibrate. Lot, so driving is actually a very complex task. And so there's so many ways that alcohol can affect all the skills that you need to drive effectively and safely. So the main way we detect alcohol impairment initially is to rely on motor impairment. So this is an example of a roadside field sobriety test where someone walks on a line and the more alcohol you're, you have in your system, the more difficult it is to, to maintain your balance and stay on that line. Um, so there are actually um, three tests that police officers use. Sometimes they add extra ones, but there are three tests that police officers use to detect impairment. Um, and then breathalyze an individual afterwards if they detect impairment. Um, so the first one is the horizontal um, gaze nystagmus test. So here's a picture of one of my former students and um, she's in the lab, in my lab, and um, she's now completing her PhD at Virginia Commonwealth. So um, one of my students, I'm really proud of her um, ceremony. Um, so she's showing the, the horizontal gaze nystagmus where the police officer would lit, um, have a flashlight. And then if you have um, been drinking, your eye will twitch. If it goes off to the side, you'll see twitching. And so um, you don't usually see that when someone is um, sober. The second thing is the walk and turn test. And so walking on the straight line, heel toe, and following the instructions of the police officer um, of the number of steps you're supposed to take before you turn is that next step. And if someone has been drinking, they tend to not be able to do that task. They step off the line because of balance issues. And then there's the one leg stand where the, if you stand on one leg and you've been drinking, it is very difficult to maintain balance in that situation. And so you can time how long someone can and do that. And these are all motor um, impairment detection tasks. So in, in all of these cases, you'll um, you'll often see consistent impairment on all three of those tasks, you know, maybe not all three in every case, depending on the dose that the person had consumed. <clears throat> when you think of acute effects, it's not just motor impairment. It's also the aggression is a concern with drinking. Um, alcohol leads to diminished judgment and heightened emotionality. Um, those, when you're not thinking clearly, when you're emotional, you're not in a good position to control your behavior. And so that, that leads in some cases to uh, um, facilitating aggressive behavior. It's, it's very interesting. You see this consistently in both humans and animals. So if you give animals alcohol, they might get in a fight as well, <laughs> just like humans would in a bar. Um, it's dose dependent and it is associated with various personality factors. So individuals who are less concerned about future consequences are more likely to behave aggressively when drinking. Um, individuals who have poor impulse control to begin with, even when sober, those are the ones that will have more trouble when drinking and not being aggressive. And then you do see a sex difference where males are more likely to be aggressive um, compared to females. So that, that's also been shown in the literature. 
subjectively, people report, you know, depending on um, when they've been drinking, they will report euphoria. They feel good when they're drinking. Um, sometimes they'll be emotional. So feel very happy, very sad, very angry, just more emotions than normal. When um, individuals are first drinking and blood alcohol concentration is rising in the blood and in the brain, um, people will report feeling more stimulated. As blood alcohol concentration declines and the drinking episode is over and they're starting to sober up, they feel more tired and sedated. Um, so that is also consist consistently seen. And interestingly about the sedation piece and the stimulation piece is that when people drink more or they have a family history of alcoholism in their family, it can affect these, um, these outcomes. So there's lots of literature on that. It's very interesting. I sort of um, uh, think more work needs to be done in that area. Um, other things that you see, pain perception is reduced. So some individuals who have um, problems with chronic pain rely on alcohol to deal with their pain. And so that is a concern if someone is not being well treated for, for medical conditions where pain is an issue. They, the physician needs to be careful about, you know, are they using other substances like alcohol to manage their pain? Um, we already talked about balance and coordination being reduced. That's the basis of the field sobriety test that police officers use. It can stimulate gastric secretions and increased hunger. Um, so sometimes individuals end up eating more. Um, a lot of times in diets, there's often the recommendation to not drink alcohol if someone is dieting a certain diet. And that's because of this, it's a reliable effect that it induces hunger. At higher doses, um, the individual might feel very nauseous or actually vomit. Um, it can in interfere with sexual performance. It's a sedative drug. So um, initially they might be more interested in sexual activity, but then um, they may not actually be able to execute effectively in that domain. Um, it increases blood flow to the skin. And, and so it can be dangerous and cause hypothermia if someone is drinking in, in cold weather and outside conditions. Um, it's a diuretic and it can lead to dehydration. Um, alcohol will reliably interfere with sleep. And what happens is the dreaming portion of sleep, the REM portion of sleep, alcohol suppresses that. And so that's why when, if you've had a night of alcohol consumption and you wake up the next morning, you may not feel well rested, even if you did sleep your normal number of hours. Also that effect um, underlies why you sometimes see blackouts. Blackouts are a failure to remember events. So it's a memory issue where you don't remember what happened um, while drinking, even if there's no loss of consciousness. So um, blackouts are partially that, that REM part of sleep that consolidates memory didn't happen. And so the next morning, the person will say, I don't remember what happened between midnight and 2 a.m. And if they didn't have the dreaming portion of sleep happening when they were sleeping, they, they didn't consolidate those memories and that's why they don't have any memory for that event. It becomes very tricky if you can imagine when there are court cases, because you know if you don't have any memory for an event, say there was an altercation and you, you were injured or sexual, there was sexual assault or something, and the person doesn't remember that portion of the evening and becomes difficult in, in um, testimony. Um, lethal dose, um, so at high, high doses, you will have an anesthetic effect in loss of consciousness. And <clears throat> the biggest concern is the, the person may vomit, co cough, choke on their vomit, um, if they choke on their vomit, they can't move their head because their motor control is impacted. So um, breathing becomes compromised and the person risks um, dying from choking. That happens a lot in autopsies. You see asphyxiation as, um, you know, the, the reason for the death in autopsies. And, um, and uh, autopsy reports um, that area of research is very interesting because um, it, it tells you a lot about um, the dangerousness of alcohol. There's a very good literature on alcohol use and causes of death. So the lethal dose um, can be lower for some individuals. It can be anywhere from 0.45 to 0.5 gram percent. Um, but if you 
for example, look, um, you know, a research study that looked at 175 fatal cases, the blood alcohol concentration at death when they assessed it was 0.355 gram percent. And so you can tell immediately that a lot of those cases must have been cases where there was like death by asphyxiation because um, the, the um, person died with a lower BAC. Also depends on the person's baseline condition. So you can see deaths at much lower BACs in younger individuals who have less experience with alcohol. And so, um, you know, that, that's just the saddest thing when someone dies um, young with their whole life ahead of them. So chronic effects. So physical dependence is the concern um, with repeated use of alcohol over time. And especially if someone starts escalating their drinking, then you really start to get worried. Um, <clears throat> you can see physical dependence even after one drinking episode. So a hangover is believed to be a mild alcohol withdrawal symptom where the person feels sick, upset stomach, fatigue, headache, thirst, depression, anxiety. Um, and so anyone who's ever experienced a hangover has experienced that physical dependence symptom. When a, someone who has a chronic drinking problem withdraws, it's actually quite dangerous. Um, withdrawal symptoms after chronic health, uh, um, heavy use can be severe. They can actually lead to death themselves. So anyone who has a serious drinking problem should never go through withdrawal by themselves. They should be under medical supervision for their safety. In the first stage of withdrawal, you will see things like tremors, um, rapid heartbeat, hypertension, excessive sweating, loss of appetite, insomnia. Then the person starts going into hallucinations where they start losing touch with reality and they you know, are hallucinating seeing things or, or anything like that. Stage three, then they start having delusions. They're very disoriented, delirium. Um, they tend to, tend to experience amnesia where they don't remember that section. And then stage four is um, when there can be seizures. And delirium tremens is the severe cases of withdrawal that peak about 72 hours after stopping drinking. <clears throat> when you look at some people who go into rehab, the amount of alcohol that they're consuming sometimes is just astounding. So, um, you know, you could have someone who's drinking, you know, a drink every hour, a drink every, you know, 30 minutes. They're drinking, you know, 24, 32 drinks a day. And then they suddenly stop drinking, you know, th th that's just the body revolts in that situation. And it can be very devastating and dangerous. Um, there's a variety of alcohol problems associated with medical, um, a variety of um, medical problems that are associated with high alcohol use chronically. <clears throat> it can actually induce brain damage. So you can see on the slide here, there's um, you know, um, an MRI scan and you can see a normal brain of a 43 year old on the left. And you can see the brain of someone who has a severe problem with alcohol on the right. And you can see the brain matter has just shrunk down. So you can see like lots of the um, cerebral spinal fluid has filled in the space from the brain matter. And, um, you know, it's like accelerating, you know, dementia in that individual, there's less brain and, you know, that's never a good thing. So it would lead to anything that your brain does, right. It would cause significant memory problems. Emotions would be blunted or, or inappropriate difficulties with balance are really reliable. So if you look at some chronic alcoholics and you measure their balance and coordination when sober, they can't stand on one foot. They can't walk a straight line. Um, you know, and a lot of times you don't see significant recovery because of that brain shrinkage. Another thing that um, is concerning for chronic alcohol users is wernicke korsakoff syndrome. This is caused by the thiamine deficiency that results from heavy drinking. When people are drinking all the time, they tend not to eat because they're getting so many calories from the alcohol. And so um, that, that just is, again, fairly devastating. You have the, um, the combined Wernicke's encephalopathy where there's mental confusion and paralysis of the nerves that control the eyes and impairment in muscle coordination. And then the course of cause syndrome, which is the long lasting and debilitating condition that is 
um, learning problems, memory problems, and motor control problems. And you know, in in those cases, once once this has happened, it's like someone who has dementia. You know, they're going to need care. They're going to need assistance, um, and they're not really going to get very much better. Another thing is the liver problems. The liver um, can develop fatty liver, which you know may not have any symptoms initially. So someone can drink heavily for years, and the liver is undergoing all kinds of changes that are not good. But the person has no symptoms that it, it is um, that liver those liver problems are occurring, and then it can develop into alcohol hepatitis and the eventually cirrhosis of the liver, liver. And so you need your liver. So when that happens, um, you know you're going to have um, all kinds of other problems. It can lead to cardiac problems and stroke. Um, impotence is another reliable finding with chronic alcohol users. And so um, lots of body systems will have negative effects. Now, I'd be remiss to not mention the developing fetus. Um, so alcohol is a teratogen. So it's important that we just briefly mention that, that this is a concern because a lot of times when people are pregnant and initially they may not realize they're pregnant, and so anyone who's of childbearing age, in any case where they think they could be pregnant, they really should abstain from alcohol. Um, it causes a devastating mental retardation that is not fixable and completely preventable. The problem with pregnancy is those first three months of pregnancy are when you see the worst effects. So immediately, if anyone thinks they should be, if thinks they might be pregnant, possibly could be pregnant, you know, maybe abstain from alcohol just in case, because it's not later in pregnancy that it's not no issue, but it's those first three months that are when the nervous system is being laid down in the fetus that are, are most worrisome. It causes fetal alcohol syndrome, which when a physician is looking at a baby at birth, you, you'll even see this on the ultrasound. Um, there, there's structural issues with the face and the skull, cranial facial abnormalities. The central nervous system, the brain is not gonna function normally. Um, and then there's growth deficiencies that you can see on ultrasound. So prenatal and postnatal. So if you've ever seen an ultrasound, you know, they measure um, the developing baby from like, you know, the head to the rump and, and they measure all kinds of things. And so they know where a baby should be developing and a baby even in utero, you can tell is behind in growth. It is the fetal alcohol syndrome is the most common form of um, caused by um, fetal alcohol syndrome is um, the most common cause of mental retardation and preventable. It also causes lots of behavioral problems, um, hyperactivity, difficulty concentrating, nervousness. <clears throat> and once the baby is born, um, you know, there's certain things that they can do to help a little bit, but um, there's no cure. And I'll show you in a second why. Um, just a little bit of terminology. So if a baby is born and was exposed to some form of alcohol, but not excessive amounts, the um, baby may have some symptoms, but not all of those three symptoms. And so fetal alcohol effects is used to describe those less severe cases of fetal alcohol syndrome. Okay, so I mentioned a second ago that there's not much you can do. And um, part of it has to do with, if you look at the slide of the brain, the brain on the left is a fetal alcohol syndrome um, brain. The brain on the right is a normal developing brain. And you can see the size of the fetal alcohol syndrome brain is significantly smaller. There's just less brain matter. That's what the mental re retardation comes from is there's less brain matter. You can also see the deformities in the facial features. So um, the face looks very flat, just like if you look at the brain, the brain, the, the cell sci and gyri of the brain, the, the folding of the brain, it also looks flat. So folding of the brain allows you to have more brain matter inside your skull. So folding is good. And if you don't see the folding, that means that you have less brain matter. And you can see that from the image that there's less folding, less brain matter. And um, so it's not surprising that a child has significant mental retardation in those cases. Okay, so how does alcohol act in the brain? So we're going back to just 
regular brain, adult brain. Um, we know that as a sedative drug, alcohol decreases excitatory activity in the brain and enhances inhibitory activity. So it's sedating the brain and the central nervous system. It also alters lipid membranes of neurons, decreasing conduction of messages. And so again, sedating the brain. The alcohol is a very messy drug. So unlike the other drugs we've talked about so far, alcohol is really all over the place, affecting almost every major neurotransmitter system in the brain. So when I go to a conference and I, you know, say I go to the Research Society on Alcoholism conference, if I were to walk around and look at all the research on posters and talks, I could find a talk or poster about a research project on every neurotransmitter because alcohol is affecting all of them. It interferes with glutamate, increases GABA, which is sedating the brain, stimulates um, serotonin, it increases adenosine, which is like that sleepiness hormone, uh, hormone, sleepiness neurotransmitter, um, and all of these sorts of things are the sedating effects. But it's messy because the neurotransmitters, um, you know, you don't have one single thing happening. Uh, it makes it very complicated. And I'm going to stop there, but um, lots of information in the chapter. And so please take a look and let me know if you have other questions. If you want me to do any lectures on any of the other little bits of material, you know, I didn't want to make the lecture super long, but if there are anything in the alcohol chapter, I did pack a lot of information in that chapter. So please let me know if you want a little tiny lecture about a topic. Have a great week, everybody.